realistic and you know it's Casey Casey uh, thanks for your time coming to the island what sort of emotions does it mean for you this time around um yeah, I'll really know when I get on track, but um, definitely going to be, you know, slightly more, I'd say, by uh, come by the end of Sunday's race. But, uh, you know, we've had a, a fantastic long run here. This morning you had the wonderful achievement of a corner being named after you. What did you think of that? Now, that's something very special, you know. It's, it's uh, something that I never expected, never, uh, never thought would happen to me. And now, uh, you know, every time we go around that track, you know, I can actually explain what's going on through uh, not turn three anymore. It, it's my turn, so... Uh, it's, it's very special. Casey, two things coming into Sunday you've spoken about. Confidence is one thing. What about the foot injury though? Where are you at there? The foot, uh, not great at the moment to be honest. Um, you know, day by day and, and race, you know, each day I'm out on the bike, it seems to be getting a little bit worse and I think uh, I basically just need to get off it and get time uh, away from it. And actually just have some free time with my family would be really nice because, um, you know, these seasons they're getting more and more races on the calendar, got more tests, more appearances and uh, everything starts crowding in pretty quickly. And the four wheels, you've had a pretty strong link with the Vodafone team, are we going to see you in V8s? Not sure yet, um, you know, I've got to be realistic and, you know, it's something completely different to what I've ever done and I'd have to, to relearn everything I've, I ever know now. So um, we'll see what can happen in the future. You eating the one you caught today? Uh, before weekends that I'm racing, normally I, uh, I don't eat any, any sort of seafood or fish. So we'll, uh, you know, hopefully they can, they can keep it for a while. We've got family here, so they'll probably all tuck into it. Casey, thanks for your time. Good luck Sunday. Thank you. Like a sombre executioner walking up to deliver a mortal blow to a one-time king, Pat McQuaid swiftly swung the blade on Lance Armstrong's career. UCI will ban Lance Armstrong from cycling and UCI will strip him of his seven Tour de France titles. Lance Armstrong has no place in cycling. The sport embarrassed and bitter, accusing previous administrations of being asleep at the wheel. And if I have to apologise now on behalf of the UCI, what I will say is that I am sorry that we couldn't catch every damn one of them red-handed and throw them out of the sport. Armstrong still in denial, but the disgraced seven-time champion's Twitter account now reflecting accurately his exile from the sport. And tour officials now have a gaping hole in the record books. The winner from 1999 to 2005 wiped. Former teammate and the first Aussie to wear yellow, Phil Anderson, says no one from the tainted decade deserves the honour. I think they should just leave that as a memory, as a bad memory of, uh, of this period of time and uh, that we never go back this, uh, that direction again. Lance Armstrong has no place in cycling, so he deserves to be forgotten in cycling now. The drastic dethroning leaving a sour taste over Lance's Australian experience at the Tour Down Under. Cuts pretty deep, you know, so disappointment is the thing that comes to mind. I feel as if I had a fairly serious kick in the guts. The last of Armstrong's million dollar sponsors Oakley pulled out overnight. Insurance companies and the Tour preparing to sue to reclaim tainted prize money. The IAC also reviewing the bronze time trial medal he won at the Sydney Olympics. Ian Cohen, 10 News. It was fitting America's all-conquering dream team captured gold on the final day of the Olympics as they sealed the United States place on top of the medal tally. Reporter Ian Cohen joins us from London and Ian, the dream team was pushed all the way by Spain. Yeah, they certainly were, Rob. At the start of this tournament, everyone just said, well, let's hand the multi-billion dollar dream team the gold medal now. Spain obviously had other thoughts. Kevin Durant was very good for the Americans. He finished with 30 points. But for Spain, there was going to be no redemption for the same title bout in Beijing. This is how the final day of the Olympics unfolded. The Dream Team have lived up to their lofty title, but only just. A dogged Spain refusing to allow the big names to dictate terms before eventually succumbing. The Terminator was LeBron James, who dragged his team over the line late in the game to deliver the golden seven-point win. LeBron James, stand by, clear for takeoff, throws it down. 
James's Olympic gold adding to his NBA haul and keeping the state's reputation intact. The men's marathon saw Michael Shelley finish at 16th, the best of the Aussies behind surprise winner Ugandan Stephen Kiprotic. On the mountain bike course, Daniel McConnell was 21st, Cull Harvey of the Czech Republic taking gold. In the pool, the Sharks finished on a winning note, downing the USA to come home 7th. And the final Aussie to compete in the 2012 Olympics was Chloe Esposito, who finished 7th in the modern pentathlon. So let's have a look at that medal tally as it finishes up here from London 2012. USA with 46, 29 and 29. China then 38. Team GB with 29. A great games for them. And Australia in 10th spot with 7, 16 and 12. They're now packing up the 16,000 beds out of the Athletes' Village and it's time to say cheerio from London and allo to Rio. Sally Pearson will hurdle with Australia on her back tomorrow morning as she aims to become the first Aussie to win an Olympic track gold medal since Cathy Freeman in 2000. Reporter Ian Cohen joins us from London. Ian Pearson will start the hot favourite. Yeah, Rob, she certainly will. She's got all the form going in, obviously. She had a hiccup a couple of weeks ago, but she's not worried about that particular defeat. She is the world champion. She did silver in Beijing. She desperately wants to go one better here in London. And look, really, everyone is looking forward to the race tonight, which should be absolutely enormous. Uh, Kelly Wells and Dawn Harper, maybe they'll give her a bit of a hard time, but you would think that the fastest girl in the semis is our girl, Sally. Down at the sailing at Weymouth, well, for Tom Slingsby, it was on Golden Pond. A five-time world champion, Tom Slingsby finally sailed into our Olympic history. His family and friends watching on as he secured gold in the laser class, an emotional win on the water. He's so happy and yeah, there's words can't describe the feeling you have and yeah, it's just, just an awesome moment for me. A whirlwind hit Weymouth as Slingsby celebrated, but the 27-year-old will now take a break from the small boats and race America's Cup ahead of Rio. And Nathan Outeridge and Ian Jensen have all but secured another gold after dominating the 49er class. At the velodrome, Anna Mears got into the semis of the sprint as she chases gold. Shane Perkins took bronze in the men's. Out on the range, Michael Diamond plummeted from a gold medal position, finishing fourth in the trap despite an almost perfect qualifying shoot. I set a new Olympic record and equal the world. That's a bit of a cushioning there for me at the moment. Um, Obviously very disappointed, to, you know, placing fourth. Australia's track hopes rest with Sally Pearson, who recorded the fastest heat time in history for the 100 metre hurdles. Her coach denying the world champ is feeling any pressure. No, no, Sally's about racing for Sally and for athletics and for Australia, not about what anyone else is doing. But rival Bridget Foster Hilton clipped the hurdles and didn't take her elimination well. Still on the track, a 19 year old Steve Solomon was gallant but outclassed in the men's 400 final, while Alana Boyd was eliminated early in the pole vault, missing all three attempts at 4.45 metres. At the basketball, Australia upset Russia by two points after a final bell three-point buzzer beater from Paddy Mills. We've been working on some, some late, late clock things and um, yeah, we, we had something to, to draw up and, and it worked out perfectly. They now play the USA in a quarter final, but our hockey ruse campaign is over after a nil all draw with Argentina. Although the most painful games moment belonged to German diver Stefan Feck, who botched his springboard and scored zero from all judges with an old fashioned backwhacker. Ouch! <laughs> that was a golden moment, but for all the wrong reasons, I reckon he would be waking up pretty sore and sorry this morning, London time. Let's have a look at that medal tally, and I think contractually we have to do it. There's no other reason for it at the moment, because China are still dominating. 31, 19 and 14, the USA with 29, Team GB still doing well with 18, the Kiwis are still above us, and we are now, we've moved up a little bit, we're into 19th place with 2, 12 and 8. Let's hope there is some more Aussie gold on offer. Sally Pearson obviously is going to be the focus. The the men's triathlon, that goes around Hyde Park. We've got three genuine favourites in that one as well. Usain Bolt comes back for the 200 metres. He'll be firing up there. Reckons he wants to play for Manchester United. And Rob, can you believe this? Went out partying after the 100 metres with the women's Swedish handball team. The uh, benefits of being the 100 metre title holder. Russell Mark has always been a straight shooter on and off the range. The 48-year-old firing up over criticism of his wife posing for a magazine. Some of the journalism that's been written about the whole matter I found to be pretty low and I think Lauren's upset 
and one particular article that um, likened her to something, you know, out of a porn actress or doing something, you know, which to me was morally wrong and, you know, she's a mother of two children and I thought that was a really low act. Eddie Maguire, the man in the gun, after going to print with the comment in an Olympic article that used the term soft porn. If I said that against that journalist's wife, he'd be all over me, and I know the, the raff I'd cop there. I just thought he should have picked up the phone and said, Russell, you've got some issues, let's discuss it. Lauren tight-lipped, but her husband steadfast. It upset her, obviously, at training yesterday. There was a lot of media there to watch her first round, and she didn't compete well. Um, she took it hard, and it's far from porn. I mean, there would be... Um, Gee, a dozen athletes that I could name over the last couple of years that have done very, very similar things and great, if it promotes them and their sport, I've got no issue with it. Mark says of course the pair are disappointed, but he's not going to let the furor distract him from chasing another Olympic gold medal. You can't say it helps. Um, I'm probably old enough to deal with it, but I don't think Lauren was and you know that's why she's been locked up and told just to concentrate on her shooting. You know, at the end of the day you are judged by your performance on competition day. No one remembers you for anything that is involved in the lead up and all I'm looking for is a good result and then that'll probably shut a lot of people up if I can achieve it. It was history in the making here at the Champs Elysees in more ways than one. Orica Greenwich becoming the first Australian team to complete the tour and Bradley Wiggins, the first British rider to claim the leader's yellow jersey. Half Australian, remember. I spoke to him as he made his way through the huge crowds here in Paris after he was crowned. Just take us through your, your feelings at the moment. It's, it's, it's different to how I felt 24 hours ago, really, and <coughs> I've had a, a day to soak it in yesterday. And Today we were just 100% concentrating on the lead out for Cav, so obviously it was a different focus. And now I'm just trying to go in with the flow, getting pulled left and right, and it's not real at the moment. He's absolutely dominated this race with a lead of over three minutes to his teammate Chris Froome. And while some other riders hit the turf, he worked very hard for Mark Cavendish, leading the team into the final sprint. The Manx Missile collecting his fourth consecutive stage win on this famous street. And while there were celebrations there, clearly for the likes of Cadell Evans, he had a different taste and had time for family. Orica Green Edge, a unique place in history as the first Australian team to compete in the world's biggest bike race. We have arrived and uh, every team has not only looked at what the riders have done, but also the support team. We're going to go away from this and, and come back next year a lot more experienced and um, I'm sure that uh, a little bit more success. These young blokes still need a couple of old dogs around to teach some tricks, so uh, yeah, probably do another one, I reckon. So the Olympics now looms for many of these riders, but for the Tour de France next year at the same time, it will be celebrating its 100th edition. Yes, you're right, the title defence for Cadell Evans is now very much on the ropes and he could be in for more pain tonight. It's a 226 kilometre stage, the longest stage on the tour and Friday the 13th might be unlucky if indeed Team Sky decide to turn the screws on Team BMC. There's two very steep climbs in the first 80 k's and then flattens out before a final little pinch into the finish line at St John de Marianne. Now for Cadell Evans, obviously stage 11 was really where he was born undone Let's have a look at the highlights. Down and all but out, an exhausted Cadell Evans barely able to walk Cadell. Cadell. or talk after a taxing stage in the Alps which looks certain to end his title defence. Cadell Evans is looking to be in trouble here. Evans cracked on a steep climb six kilometres from the finish. He lost more than a minute to leader Bradley Wiggins and now trails the yellow jersey leader by three minutes 19. You believe the title defence is still alive? It's getting more and more complicated, uh, you know, more than three minutes is complicated, knowing also that you have the time trail at the end, that disappointed, of course, I think that when you are here to, uh, to defend a title like this, but uh, we, have, we have done great until now. Stage 11 was the most picturesque so far, and while most of the riding was done uphill, competitors certainly struggled just as much going down. Evans made an early attempt to catch Wiggins off guard. There's Cadell, that's the attack, that was the plan because he's put TJ up the road and now Cadell Evans has launched an attack. But Team Sky was too strong, reeling him in with ease. Cadell now fourth overall, the stage won by Frenchman Pierre Roland. So it looks like more Alpine stages are awaiting for Cadell Evans and Bradley Wiggins of course is very much in the box seat now. We'll wait and see how it unfolds tonight.
What began as a relaxing 14th stage turned into chaos 24 kilometres from the finish. Oh, well, Evans has had a flat tyre at the top of the climb. Evans with a rear tyre puncture. His teammates and the BMC team car nowhere to be seen. Cadell Evans is losing a huge amount of time here. Further investigation revealed tax had been thrown onto the road just before the summit of the last climb. Three punctures. Yeah. All tax, I think. Nails, protesters or some... Kind-hearted people on the road trying to ruin my season. I don't know what uh, what the word I have to use for this, but it's uh, it's criminal because it's uh, it's a lot of risk already for the riders in the downhill, and uh, the crashes were happening today and. And all the risks that they were taking with this was uh, pretty insane. Evans was forced to stop on three separate occasions, but overall leader Bradley Wiggins and the peloton graciously slowed to allow Evans to catch up. The stage win had gone, we finished the climb, no one had attacked or got away, and um, there was nothing left in the bike race for it, so it just seemed the honourable thing to, to unite a little bit, and no one wants to benefit through somebody else's misfortunes. Hopefully in life, karma, karma comes around. Did it make the descent very treacherous though because you're always looking out for, for these things? Um, no, you know, it's 70k now, you can't see tax on the road, but um, well, my main thing was it just happened to me three times and at crucial moments. Luis Leon Sanchez was the strongest rider of the breakaway, winning the stage. Wiggins and Evans finished on the same time, with Cadell still three minutes and 19 seconds back in fourth place. At the Tour de France, Ian Cohen, 10 News. Craig, congratulations obviously on uh, game 250 coming up coach. When you first moved to Melbourne, was it fairly daunting to take over a, a team in your own right and be a part of the NRL? Oh yeah, it certainly was. Um, something that uh, you know, probably I wanted to do for, for a little while, you know, four or five years and all of a sudden it happened, you know, very my way the highway early. Now there was an urban myth that when you came here, one of the first running assignments that you set for the team, you actually ran with the team and you beat all the boys home. Yeah, I remember thinking, you know, I, I won the runs, but at the end of the day, it was, uh, I was really concerned then. I thought I had a bunch of guys that were in really poor physical condition, you know, <laughs> so I was a bit worried about that. You know, I think you can sort of learn a little bit about their, their mental toughness when you're actually working with them. Highlights and lowlights, and are they one and the same thing in a way? Oh, yeah, I suppose, you know, I don't think anyone, you know, there's no prize for guessing what the low light is, you know. It was something that happened and, um, you know, certainly it wasn't right and it was a really tough time for the club. To win the grand final is, you know, the best thing in the world, you know, to a, to a sports person. But when you think about it, you know, you need to be the best team there for a month. Whereas in minor premierships, you need to be the best team for 26 weeks. You've had a wonderful environment here with a mixture of soccer club, AFL club, rugby league club as well. If you were to stay in Melbourne beyond your contract with Storm, would you have a think about going across to an AFL club? Yeah, it's, it's something you, I, I haven't really sort of probably considered it seriously, but, you know, the clubs are better resourced than our, our clubs, you know. It'd be an exciting thing to be part of, I'd imagine, but, um, again, I know a little bit about motivating rugby league people, I suppose, but I think uh, AFL players are probably a little bit different. But at the end of the day, you know, at some stage, it'd be nice if, you know, to, to be involved in, uh, in, the, in the sport. Thanks, Craig. Good luck against West Tigers. I appreciate it. Thanks, sir. Ta Yes, thanks very much, Robin. Good evening. You're quite right. Being lost in this whole Shriekathon affair is the fact that there's a Grand Slam title up for grabs. It's Azarenka's first Grand Slam final. She'll be wanting to get through for a maiden victory. Sharapova is chasing her second Australian Open campaign. There's $2.3 million up for grabs for the winner. And there's also the women's world number one ranking. So lots to be played for. Forget about the screaming. There should be plenty on court. Now, last night, the men, well, they could hardly blow out a candle at the end of nearly five hours. Andy Murray... Novak Djokovic, what a semi-final it was. In the end, the Serb won. This is how he did it. Fighting fatigue, a breathing problem and a courageous Andy Murray, Novak Djokovic delivered when it counted. It's one versus two Sunday night. It was an unexpected result given the state Djokovic was in midway through the match, the Serbian wilting before a mysterious remedy saw him bounce back. Where did you find the strength to come back from two sets to one down in this one? Um, I don't know, in some liquids like uh, energy drink, uh, <laughs> water and uh, banana. He's done that many, many times before and he runs very well even when he's breathing heavy. But Djokovic insists he wasn't foxing, instead blaming it on allergies. 
Gets the break. I talk with a couple of players that have a, a little allergy problems this year uh, in Australia for no reason. You know the ones that they didn't have in the last couple of years, so they had the reactions this year. Falling short once again, Murray was left frustrated, and the routine drug test that followed did his mood no favors. I've just done the drug test, a urine test, and they've just told me that I need to sit down for 30 minutes before I can give blood, um, and I want to go. I want to get out of here, so. I'm annoyed with that. Jackie Reid, 10 News. So now Djokovic is through, but in terms of head-to-head -head ratio, it's actually Nadal that leads 16-13. But the Serb has won the last six encounters, including the final at Wimbledon and also at the US Open. This is their third final together. Rafa will be trying to redress that balance. But he doesn't think it's a disadvantage to Novak Djokovic to only have the one day off between the semi and the final. You can say he's unfair, yes, but not crazy unfair. That's really unfair is that uh, the US Open and you don't have a day off between semi-finals and finals. He's the favourite after being number one of the world and after playing fantastic and beating me the last six times. So just happy to be there. Now that men's final is still 24 hours away. Of course tonight on Rod Lave Arena it's all about the women. I'm just about ready. Hang on a moment Rob. Actually, I reckon I'm ready to go now because the decibels are going to be up over 100. I'm going to make sure... I can't hear you, Rob. Hopefully I can't hear the girls either. There's no mute switch in there. It's going to be a shriek-a-thon. It was hard to tell if Anthony Bell was in a dream or a nightmare. Emerging from the jury room, his emotion almost spilling over. You know, I'm still waiting for one of the um, my crew members to wake me up and say, you on watch, get up, do you know what I mean? You still have to the race, you know? Um, because it's been like a, a pretty busy 24 hours. A simple radio gaffe responsible for the protest, an inquiry into a competitor's rigging not allowed under the rules of sailing. Uh, what colour is the sail they've got up, with the main sail they've got up? They've both, uh, both got grey sails up. Uh, copy that, that's uh, great news, thanks. Loyal's tactician is a sailor maker by trade and maintained he was asking about the $250,000 sale he'd sold to Wild Oats 11. I did a silly thing in hindsight, but when you, you haven't gone to sleep for 30 hours mm -hmm. and the implication was that I'd done something outside the rules where I knew that that was not the case. And while last night's arrival and celebrations were subdued as the crews mingled, today it was unbridled joy for the Loyal crew and their families. Yeah, that's one of the things that's probably been nicked off the crew, you know what I mean? Sort of that, um, you know, you sort of finished. I don't know if you guys caught footage of us all carrying on like we were after it. I just wasn't sure actually who was steering the boat when. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, uh, it was a great moment that got cut short. Anthony Bell's next aim is to go back to back to continue that winning feeling for him and his crew. But for the moment, he's just satisfied that the name Loyal is finally in the record books for this Blue Water Classic. In Hobart, Ian Cohen, 10 News. A simple single page fax delivered old school style from UCI Cycling Headquarters in Europe has turned a long time Ryan family dream into an Australian team tour reality. Oh, it's a very exciting day, um, you know, we've waited, uh, uh, well we started planning 18 months ago and uh, it's finally arrived, this uh, fax was there this morning uh, at the office and uh, you know, we're just overjoyed. Green Edge and Radio Shack Nissan, the home of the Schleck brothers, were the last two outfits admitted to next year's 18-team world tour. The colours will remain the same, but the history-making team's jersey will be kept under wraps until the official unveiling at January's Tour Down Under. Yeah, they will be riding at the Jacob A Classic in, in a kit, but the official kit uh, launched on Jan 15. Father and son joining the team in camp at Canberra's AIS this evening to celebrate with the 30 riders on their roster. We'll certainly have a couple of champagnes and, and really enjoy and then tomorrow it all gets back to business of what we need to do before the uh, tour down under. So yeah, look, a lot of excitement and it's great for the riders to know that you know they showed commitment to come across. And those riders include Aussie road cycling royalty and the man who put it together overjoyed. The dream actually started 15, 20 years ago and I think the evolution of Australian, Australian cycling with performances on the track with Robbie McEwen and Stuart O'Grady with Cadell Evans winning the Tour de France this year and this is really the icing on the cake. Ian Cohen, 10 News.
Yeah, thanks and good evening. Look, the conditions here, it was an absolute furnace here yesterday at Royal Melbourne and today, while well, it's been raining cats and dogs. There's been some hardy souls that have got out there on the golf course. That's just the players. What about the crowd? There was some brave punters. Obviously, crowd numbers have been down. Everyone's had the wet weather gear on. The internationals really had to fight back. They got tailed up in the morning session. They were trailing by as far back as 11 and 6. And then all of a sudden, the fight back started to emerge in the afternoon session. It started with the South Africans, the Koreans got involved as well, and let's see how it unfolded here at Royal Melbourne. From searing temperatures to persistent rain, the cool change brought another cold exchange between Tiger and Steve Williams, and again Woods struggled on the green. Shouldn't miss. And does. But Hunter Mahan had no trouble producing this eagle and the first highlight of the day. Lands at the front, releases. Oh my! Robert Allenby was given a tough task, Dustin Johnson increasing the degree of difficulty for Woods. Now we know that Tiger Woods is the great uh, improviser of shots, guys, but uh, has he ever played one off the top of the marquee? Rio Ishikawa secured the sole point for the internationals, while Tiger finally broke through, scoring for the first time in this tournament. A brilliant putt by Phil Mickelson giving the Americans an 11-6 lead to close the morning session. Hello. Oh my goodness. That shot set the tone of the afternoon. The players putting on a clinic, enjoying a break in the rain. Their long range putts finally dropping where they hadn't for the past two days. Left to right at the hole. Please, can these Americans hold some putts? KJ Choi mastered the greens, getting the soggy crowd's attention. Whoa, yes, KJ. Those steely eyes. And Tiger made peace with his putter for a much-needed birdie on the 10th. Tiger on 10. As he finally made one, he has. But Johnson lost his way, firing off a wayward tee shot and picking out one unlucky gallery member. Look at that! The American charge beginning to waver as the internationals launched a promising fight back. Yes, Ernie. Great putt. With the weather quickly turning foul, Schwartzel tried to hitch a ride on a roving oh, golf cart. That might be in the back of that. Uh, just the back of the just buggy, keep driving, just keep driving. Take it up to the edge of the green. And Closing in on points, the internationals were still teased by the greens. Oh, yes, please. They got there eventually, handing Watson and Simpson their first loss of the week. Jackie Reid, 10 News. Now, tomorrow, of course, it all reverts back to the singles, so we'll have 12 pairings going around. The tee-off will be mid-morning here in Melbourne. It will go right down to the wire, one would expect, so there's going to be a lot of pressure on those final pairings as they come towards the finish line around about 4 o'clock local time here. Of course, we'll have all those details for you, and who knows what sort of weather we could have in Melbourne tomorrow. Bob Davis debuted for the Cats in 1948, starting a six-decade love affair between him, the game and the fans. And the floor staff have put in some uh, money and we've decided to give you a camera to take home this week. Oh, a camera? Oh, that's tremendous. What about that refrigerator I've been eyeing up there, Luke? <laughs> Named after the speedy train to Melbourne, the Geelong Flyer was known for his pace and tenacity, a driving force behind premierships in 1951 and 52. Recruited from the Clunes area, Davis played 189 games, won the best and fairest in 1957, was All-Australian and represented Victoria 13 times. He captained the Cats for four years before taking up the coaching role and forging lifelong friendships. A uh, boy called Newman, John Newman. Didn't he play with the seconds last year? Yes, yeah, he played in the reserves last year, only four games. And uh, he's now... He used to go to the grammar school, but he's here in Geelong. He guided champions like Farmer and Wade to Gardenia Park, steering his beloved cats to a flag in 1963, over the top of the rough, tough Kennedy Commando Hawks. At three-quarter time, there's, you can see pieces of the video of me talking to all the players, and I actually said, now, we've got them beaten, 
This quarter, I want him to show what genuine football is. Also known as Woofer, his all-round contribution to the sport was recognised in 1996 with an inaugural induction into the AFL Hall of Fame. He was a Cats Life member and was named in their team of the century. His innate ability to connect with people on all levels made him a cult hero before the term even existed. If you want to get the most out of your game, then you've got to get the most out of your body. And that's where Strive can help you. Along with Jack Dyer and Lou Richards, Davis carved out a niche in the brave new mix of sport and entertainment. His passion for the game, his sense of humour and unique delivery shone through in his 30 years under lights, bringing the game into our lounge rooms with the iconic league teams. I love bangers and mash sausages, they are spent. Well, he has a what? big bag of sausages. What? Oh, alligator <laughs> sediment. He will also be remembered for his panel work on Sunday morning's World of Sport, where his legend grew to new generations. It's been a pleasure to be associated with it, Ron. I mean, it, it hasn't been a job, it's just been a delight. In his last years, he savoured presenting the Premiership Cup to a new breed of cats, almost not wanting to part with the cherished mug. For over 40 years, he dined out on his tongue-in-cheek claim to be the Cats' only living premiership coach until the drought was broken, and he was remembered then along with his catch cry. Geelong are the premiers for 2007. It's fantastic, unbelievable, Bobby. Davis had been ill in recent months and was admitted to hospital on the weekend. He was 82. Ian Cohen, 10 News. Thanks very much and good evening. Beautiful conditions here at Stall today and a little bit unusual because they don't normally have Anzac Day in the middle of the Easter period. Anzac Day started with the dawn service and everyone paying their respects to the diggers in the Stall Main Street. But all eyes are going to be on tomorrow's final. Of course, you can see it live and exclusive on 1HD tomorrow afternoon. The man who's going to be off the back mark is Kim Collins, the 0-3 world champion. And Kim, how are you going to win this thing tomorrow? <laughs> I just have to concentrate on my own ways tomorrow and try not to wheel in the guys too quick because that's a major mistake most people make. You focus on your race, you run your own time and that's how you're going to win. How hard is that when you're so used to having everyone line up next to you, you've got to take away the focus from the guys who are going to be a long way out? Well, it's very difficult because psychologically you think everybody has a head start and they're going to beat you, but you can't think that way. And Kim, what about stall generally? You've run on grass 20 years ago at home, but how have you enjoyed being here over Easter? I enjoyed it very much. I, I see it as a great event because it seems like it's a very fair, we give persons a chance to win. So I believe I have a great chance and an excellent chance of winning. I want to come and win and enjoy the, the, you know, what stall has to offer. And it could be a springboard maybe for you into the world champs and who knows what could be ahead? Yes, definitely. This is a great chance for me to see how well my body is holding up. And, you know, if you run fast over 120, you know, 100 metres are a lot less. So you'll do well also over 100 metres. Good luck tomorrow, Kim. Thank you very much. Kim Collins there joining us. He's going to be the scratch marker. And, of course, there's a couple of dangers to watch out for. Weaver and McCabe, a lot of money has come for them as well. We'll have all the details for you live and exclusive tomorrow afternoon on 1HD from here at Stall. Yes, thanks very much, Stephen, and good evening. It appears that the deal is just about done. 10 News understands that the Casey Scorpions have emerged as the clear favourites for the signature of Brendan Favola. The troubled spearhead has arrived in Melbourne just this hour to finalise the details and wrap them up before training with the club, maybe even as early as tomorrow evening. Now, Favola has had other clubs still vying for his services, but it appears the Scorpions are in the box seat. He's expected to take a break next week and head off on holiday but that's not suggested to be to the United States to try out his punting boot. Instead there was speculation of that early but that's been denied. A quick break before coming back to resume training and playing with the VFL outfit. And now 10 News has exclusive pictures of Brendan Favola's arrival at Melbourne Airport. We'll have those along with any of Fev's thoughts for you on our evening news at 6.30. Stephen? Yes, thanks very much and good afternoon. The marathon for the men and the women got underway very early this morning here in Delhi, but competitors still had to battle the very hot, the humid and the smoggy conditions of the capital. And it wasn't until the final few kilometres that Michael Shelley really kicked into gear. In just his second ever marathon, the Queenslander was eighth at the halfway mark before storming home to take the silver behind Kenya's John Keeley. Oh, I can't believe it. Oh, oh. Oh, it's awesome. Kenya also took out the women's. Irene Koskai overcoming an early stumble and some sledging. I was thinking you walked on the floor. Seriously, I'm sorry. 
to take the gold, while Aussie Lisa Waitman put in a courageous effort to finish third. And for the sixth time in seven women's Commonwealth Games marathons, Australia will take a medal. The hockey ruse faced an Herculean clash for the gold medal with trans-Tasman rivals New Zealand. Australia jumped out to an early 1-0 lead and then set about defending it. Still going, Mickelson. Oh, that was... Um... That was beautiful skill. And while the Kiwis levelled, the Hockey Roos managed to score again. But with 30 seconds left on the clock, a last gasp effort saw New Zealand finish full time at 2 all. It's gone in! The Kiwis have levelled it up 2 all with 30 seconds remaining. With no goals in extra time, it went to a shootout. Five girls from each team, with the Kiwis missing early and some nervous moments for the Aussies until this. So, while the fresh-faced hockey roos had certainly got the job done here at the hockey stadium, winning gold, it was their teammates from the Australian team who turned up and basically stole the show. Other gold medalists looking good in the hockey roos skirts. The win, a perfect sign-off for retiring coach Frank Murray. It was a big ask of the girls and, uh, and they came through and uh, it's a credit to them. Top seeds Casey Brown and Cameron Pilly have won Australia's first squash gold medal at these games, defeating New Zealand's duo in the mixed doubles final. It's Brown's third medal after her singles bronze. She and Donna Urquhart won the women's doubles bronze. There was all three colours in the pool with Charlene Stratton claiming the top prize in the women's three metre springboard. JL Patrick claimed bronze. A perfect 10 from England's Tom Daly helped him to an upset goal over Aussie Matthew Mitchum who was relegated to silver. Oh, oh, Matt Mitchum not able to deliver the knockout blow. He... Nazmi Johnson earned 100 points to clinch the top spot in the women's gymnastics all around. And Luke Durbridge has beaten 44 degree temperatures to round off the nation's outstanding game cycling campaign with a bronze in the men's 40k road time trial. And there's one medal still left to be decided and it's another Anzac battle. This one between the two netball teams going for gold. They're the two best teams in the world and they've clashed in every major competition in the final for the last 15 years, since 1995. So that rivalry, a decade and a half, it's about to boil over again here in Delhi. Should be an absolute beauty. Yes, thanks very much and good evening. Behind me you can see the Red Fort, one of the famous tourist venues in this historic town. Old Delhi is just over there. But this is an area that our Australian athletes are very unlikely to see. They won't be doing the tourist venues. They're going to be kept on a very tight leash. Last night there was an email sent out to the Australian athletes on a number of things, including hygiene and security as well as the village. And the Australian Commonwealth Games Association said they're reasonably happy with the security for the stadium, for the village and for the transport routes, but by implication they're not so impressed with anything outside of the narrow confines of the game structure. It's going to be tight, it has to be. Um, we're, we're really at this point looking at only uh, um, uh, certainly uh, games venues. Now the British Games Associations have certainly been the most vocal. They've said there's a 48 hour ultimatum for the Delhi organisers to get things right. Mike Fennell who is the Games boss is flying in here later this afternoon from America to try and sort out what is going on here in Delhi. As far as our Australian swimmers are concerned they're going to be in planes tomorrow heading to Kuala Lumpur for their training camp but still there is a lot of pressure for some of our stars to have a second think about whether they come here or not. If any if one of them wants to pull out, I respect them the same way. I believe it's not that important that they will do a silly decision. So the situation continues to unfold here in Delhi. We'll have more details for you later on on Sports Tonight. Year 12 is tough enough for the average 17-year-old, balancing projects and exams with a burgeoning social life and the prospect of university. But Georgia Nanscorn's final year at high school is anything but average, juggling homework with stick work as one of our youngest ever hockey roos. Uh, it's tough, but um, I wouldn't give up for the opportunities I've had with the Australian hockey team to just because of school. So I have to be very organised and um, I've got a lot of help from my teachers and from coaches as well, helping me manage the year. 
Her subjects are visual communication, design, English and maths, but her aspirations are to be a star striker like kookaburra Jamie Dwyer. I would love to be Jamie's a pretty amazing player, but um, yeah, him and Melanie Twitt um, was sort of someone I looked up to, particularly because she wasn't the tallest player out there and she was so good that um, like I really thought that I'd be able to do it too. Hockey has a twin focus this year, the World Cup a month before the Commonwealth Games, and this pocket rocket is a strong chance to be wearing green and gold for both. She's a very exciting prospect because she has such athleticism and such a feel for the game and uh, that, doesn't, uh, that doesn't come along too often. But she's still got to learn the game, she's still got to learn to play at this level, she's still got to strengthen up physically. And the signs are good. Georgia is the great, great niece of footy's first Brownlow medalist, Kaji Greaves. And she joins the likes of Golden Hockey Roos, Alison Annan, Rochelle Hawkes and Nikki Hudson as prodigies which all represented Australia as teenage tyros. I got picked, I played my first game the day after my 17th birthday and now been in it for a year and played 23 games or so. So, you know, it's all very, very special. Ian Cohen, 10 News. Todd Woodbridge is now a legitimate bronze dozzy, immortalised with our greatest players in our open air hall of fame. It's a little humbling, to be honest, to be out here with the likes of Laver, my idol, Ken Rosewell, um, Margaret Court, just a couple away from his Pat Rafter, my peer in my day. So um, I, I feel you know, very honoured. The Woodies have a stunning record with six Wimbledons their crowning achievement. But the popped collar on the bust is more than just a fashion statement. With the artist, we got to choose what we wanted on and that, that jacket was um, from the Olympic medal ceremony in Sydney so it has um, some real feel to it as well. Pat Rafter was honoured in 2008. Today Todd Woodbridge became the 31st Australian tennis great to have his bust featured here at Garden Square. His old mate Mark Woodford will be number 32. For the first time actually at Wimbledon in the Legends, Mark and I are not going together because he's got too old. He's had to go up an age group to the 45. So I'll be with my, my other partner who I had success uh, with there in Jonas Bjorkman and Mark's going to be competing in the 45s with Pat Cash. Ian Cohen, 10 News. No problem. You know, you've got to take responsibility for everything I've done and, and uh, today is, uh, is exactly that. And it's, uh, it's, I think it's a good outcome for everyone in the club and myself. And that's what we do here. Very supportive group. At number 20, we've got one of the great motoring stories that developed throughout the year. And it started right here at Albert Park in Pit Lane in Melbourne, the Formula One track. And it concerns a young Englishman that debuted in season 2000, but really looked like he was going to be without a ride for 2009. That's before Ross Braun stepped in, set up Braun GP and signed Jensen Button. And Button didn't look back. He secured pole position here, went on to lead the race from start to finish on his way to the World Championship. We're away in Melbourne for 2009. It's Jensen Button, an awful start there by Ruben Button's upset win at Melbourne proved just a precursor to what became one of the great David and Goliath stories. Born out of the Honda factory team, Braun GP took on and then comprehensively beat the big boys of Formula One. Button becoming the 10th British driver to win the F1 world title. And from Braun to a lack of brains. And Serena Williams' tantrum at the US Open caused more than a stir. Williams penalised a point on match point, handing the semi-final win to Kim Clijsters. Serena losing the match and $190,000 after being slapped with a record fine. At number 18, one for all the mums as we pay tribute to Clijsters' comeback. I don't have words for this. Um, I'm just glad that I got to come back and defend my title um, from 2005. <laughs> The Belgian crowned US Open champion, the first mum since Yvonne Goulagon Cawley to win a Grand Slam. At 17, Melbourne Storm confirmed its star billing as one of the great NRL teams. Four successive Grand Finals and two Premierships. They're jumping for Troy Melbourne. They've won the title, you would have to think. 
although we've had four in a row, yeah, you never know when you're going to get another chance at a grand final. On their return to Melbourne, their timing was impeccable. Part of a network live cross. Well, it's amazing. As you join us, the players are being presented. They're walking past us right now. There's Steve Turner. The boys are actually heading up onto stage. And we can follow them up onto the stage at Princess Park. Yeah, Cam Smith's the man with the trophy there. He's held it aloft, of course, last night. And it's been a massive 24 hours for these boys. The 23 points to 16 win over Parramatta storms third flag in just 11 seasons. Jared Haynes' grand final may not have gone to script, but his near flawless year won't be forgotten anytime soon. The Dalian medal winner for 2009 is Jared Haynes. From the Dally M medal, the highest individual honour in the NRL, let's move to the highest single accolade in the AFL, and that's the Brownlow medal. And this year it was taken home by a player who for the last couple of years has been dealing with all sorts of pressure and favouritism. He's one of the best midfielders we've seen, and the medal capped off a stellar season for Gary Ablett Jr. I declare the winner of the 2009 Brownlow medal, Gary Ablett of the Geelong Football Club. Ablett, a runaway winner. Once and for all, he steps out of his famous father's footsteps. He would be stoked for me. Um, I'm, I mean, it's going to be fantastic that I can go home and say I've done something that he hasn't done. So <laughs> I'm excited about that. But, uh, yeah. And Gary Jr. achieved plenty more this year, leading the Cats to their second flag in three seasons. This year's two best teams went head-to-head -head in a battle for the ages. Geelong trailing at every break before a Paul Chapman-led fight back saw his side home. 12 points, the final margin. The Cats got their cream as the Saints cried over spilt milk. Their premiership drought stretching to 44 long years. Du sextuple vainqueur du Tour de France, Lance Armstrong. The biggest name in cycling returned to this year's Tour de France as seven-time champion Lance Armstrong got back in the saddle with Team Astana. Back to promote his Live Strong message, things didn't go all to plan as the American was forced to take a back seat to teammate Alberto Contador. Contador went on to win the Tour, Armstrong finished third before vowing to return with his own team next year. Aussie Cadell Evans had a Tour to forget, but the year wasn't a complete write-off. The 32-year-old winning the World Championship road race in Switzerland. And Cadell Evans will be in the rainbow jersey. An outstanding result for Australia. It's funny when you work for something and dream of something for so long when it actually happens, you, you don't believe it. Evans, Australia's first road race world champion. At number 11, we find ourselves back at the Grand Prix Circus and a man born in Queanbeyan who is carrying with him the hopes of a nation onto the Formula One track. And after years of driving with lowly teams, chasing sponsorship dollars and finding unique ways of not finishing a Grand Prix, Mark Webber finally broke through in Germany. His Red Bull machine charging to the line and believe me, Webber was very, very happy to finally have the monkey off his back. <laughs> Weber finally with something to savour, as he became the first Aussie to win an F1 race since Alan Jones way back in 1981. Weber backed up his win in Germany with victory in Brazil, the Red Bull driver finishing fourth overall in the title race. Yes, thanks very much, Stephen, and good evening to you. 780 words, that was the length of the letter that was fired off to AFL headquarters and then posted on the Hawthorne website. And above the letter, he had a message for Hawthorne members, including saying that he would have liked to have pursued the issue, but it's better that we all get on with what we're about, and that is winning games. And secondly, he couldn't put it past the AFL to impose sanctions on the club, such as a loss of premiership points if the matter was not settled. He sarcastically said, be assured, my future public comments will be as bland 
as those who seek to control us. Now, as for the letter that he actually fired off to Adrian Anderson, let's have a look at some of the key points there, including the fact that Jeff Kennett said that one can only assume that you had already decided to find me before receiving my letter of explanation. He went on to explain the AFL is again shooting the messenger rather than addressing the fundamental issues. He believed it would take time before he could clear his diary to provide the three hours believed that the schooling would take or until he had completed the three hours of re-education and the media would continue to focus on umpires and the issue. He also went on to say his complaint is that the AFL by consistently introducing new rules further confuses the umpires and he's worried about inconsistency between any of the three umpires that might be adjudicating on the day. I have therefore decided, he goes on to say, with regret to pay the fine that you have levied, but I am aware that unless I pay this fine, you at the AFL may well apply further sanctions against my club, which I certainly do not want to occur. He finishes by saying, so please find attach my personal cheque for $5,000 and as the AFL works to paint the sky grey and limit free speech, be assured that many of us will continue to manage our affairs as best we can to the advancement of the code and those who support it, not only the individuals or the clubs, but indeed the game itself. So certainly a scathing letter there from Jeff Kennett to Adrian Anderson. Stephen, it looks like he's paid up and certainly paid out. No doubt we'll hear more on that in the coming days. Kate Ellis might be our very own Beijing boxing kangaroo. This, this could really end in tears. This could end in a diplomatic incident here if all of a sudden I am. But the sports minister is not prepared to put everything on the line in her bet with British counterpart Jerry Sutcliffe that Australia will end up with more Chinese gold than the mother country. We're yet to actually discuss that, but um, I have ruled out the nudie run that somebody suggested to me earlier today. Well. I think that's best um, for both <laughs> for of our both countries. Of really, yeah. No matter how it turns out, yeah. nobody will have to deal with I that. I think I agree with that, <laughs> Kate. <laughs> Whether it be belting them on the cricket field, monstering the old enemy on rugby's hallowed turf, taking their top prizes on the track, on the court or the course, there's nothing better than beating the Brits, and they're starting to feel the heat. A bigger team here than we have, so you've got better opportunities perhaps. I think perhaps they might have given up on cricket and rugby and moved certainly on not, to Olympics not, at the so moment, no, is that right? So, yeah, we, did we not win the World Cup at yeah, rugby in Australia? That, that was a while ago, no, that was a while ago. Let's see how we, how we do in the next couple of weeks. And it's here on the smoggy streets of Beijing that Great Britain is desperate to reverse the trend. At the Olympics of four years ago, the athletes wearing this flag managed to secure 17 gold, 16 silver and 16 bronze, while those wearing just the small ensign of the Union Jack could only manage nine gold, nine silver and 12 bronze. But the government are putting a whole lot of pressure on those shoulders well, and, well, we, know, and we certainly hope they don't crack under no. The bet eventually decided the loser to wear the winner's shirt when the old rivals next cross paths in the sporting arena. In Beijing, Ian Cohen, 10 News. Good evening. The boats arrived at 10.51 this morning and of course the partying has been going on long and hard here in Hobart Town. I'm joined by the man who is going to be known as the Maccabi Diva of the yacht racing world. He's taken out a sporting icon, an Australian sporting icon, three times in a row, Mark Richards. Congratulations. You've had a bit of time for it to sink in. What's it feel like? Oh mate, look it's fantastic. And it's not all about me, it's about the whole Wild Oats team, you know. Bob Oatley and, um, and the whole crew of this boat is magnificent effort and an awesome team and we're really proud of what we've achieved. Coming down the Derwent, I think you had six sail changes desperately looking for the wind and there's City Index Leopard just sneaking up behind you. Yeah, look, it's what you know, yacht racing is all about and it's the, uh, it can be pretty tough sometimes but you know, we, we, we made the most of the situation and um, dealt with the sail changes brilliantly and uh, we got, got home first. And it was so close yet so far for Mike Slade and City Index Leopard but he was philosophical. They were 23 miles ahead of us some uh, dawn this morning and uh, I think we got a better jibe angle coming into Tasman Island and I, I was thinking they were wounded in some way or other because we were watching them struggle getting up here. Take us through the race because I think the boats held together beautifully, the crews worked really well. Have you had any problems at all? Well mate there's been plenty of knockers out there and three years in a row about Wild Oats' uh, integrity but she's here for the third time in a row in tough conditions and we've had some pretty uh, tough sailing and, um, and she's ready to go again. As far as the boat's concerned, will it be back next year? Will you be back next year? Oh yeah, look, we, you know, we'll see what happens. We said no last year and we're here again, so who knows. But um, you know, I'd say there'll be a chance we'll, we'll come back. I know the celebrations are going on long and hard. We've managed to sneak you away from those. But what's on the agenda tonight? Look, the Sydney Hobart's one thing. It's getting 
home alive tonight from Customs House and other things. So we're looking forward to a big, big night. Congratulations, Mark. Good on you. Thanks very much. Mark Richards, the skipper of Wild Oats 11, making history here in Hobart. More details, of course, on Sports Tonight. Only three years ago, Slater weighed in at just 70 kilograms, saddling up for track work for trainers like Gay Waterhouse. Now, 17 kilos heavier, he's doing the running instead of the riding. Like he was booting home a winner at Randwick, Slater has carved them open and got the storm on the board. I'd done a bit of horse work when I was in Innisfail and then I went down to Gay Waterhouse for six months. And I went back to Innisfail and saw the horses went out a bit and I went, got back into my football. Melbourne, a long way from Innisfail in far north Queensland, where a few short seasons back, Billy Slater drove overnight to Brisbane to get a trial game with Storm's feeder team Norths, not daring to imagine how steep his rise could be. Got the opportunity to come down, um, train up the, with the off-season with the Storm, and I got the opportunity to start in the first grade side in the first game and just trying to go from there. With a name like a gunslinger, the 19-year-old's proving to be one of the quickest in the South. Ah, oh, Billy Slater! They love you here in Melbourne. While that might be true, he's been made aware hard-won success can be fleeting. He is getting a lot of raps at the moment, and he probably deserves those. But um, you know, if he doesn't, you know, keep on the things that uh, help him play well on Sundays, well, he's going to end up back in Brisbane playing. Oh, it's pretty tough actually. I don't expect it to get any easier. Ian Cohen, 10 News. This chameleon has infiltrated two of England's sporting institutions. Former boxer Carl Power, the front man for a daring duo who've amazed the world, first appearing where every soccer fan dreams. Well, Gary Neville pointed at me at first, but I just said to him, shut it, I'm doing this for Eric Cantona, because I had Eric Cantona's name on my back. After a year of planning with mastermind mate Tommy Harris, Power also stunned Aussie cricketers in the Ashes test at Headingley. But while it was all good fun at the time, given recent world events, the pair have chosen to temporarily shelve their plans. Well, originally we had five planned. We pulled two off, and then the thing that happened in New York, it, you know, that was the end of it, really. Although their antics have been likened to the notorious Peter Hoare, they're quick to distance themselves from the serial pest. We heard about him, we've seen a bit of footage of him. Um, he's not, you know, it's different. He's doing things that, you know, he's upsetting people. He also We're lost, not upsetting Australia, people. He also lost Australia, the football, isn't he? So I believe, you know, how, how can you go down in that league? The pranksters are here to raise more than their profiles, promoting a love potion. And when the time is right, have already decided on more mayhem. One, one was going to be in, in, in Australia, one was going to be in America, and the other one was going to be top, top secret, because the last one <clears throat> was going to blow everyone away. Ian Cohen, 10 News.